Well, it is such a pleasure to be back here in the Sheeran Church. So good to see so many friends, and I won't say old friends because we aren't getting older, we're just getting better, right? Um, no, it, is, it has been a, it's such a blessing to be here. God is so good. Thank you so much for inviting me to be here. Um, my kids bring gr- greetings to all of you. My wife, Cindy, is looking forward to getting to know you and spending time with you uh, over the next few months. And so um, it, is, it is just a pleasure to be with you. My message this morning is entitled, The Best Day of Your Life. The Best Day of Your Life. What has been the best day of your life? Was it the day that you walked across the platform and the president of the university or the principal flip the tassel from one side of the mortar board to the other? Was that the best day of your life? Maybe it was the day that you got a brand new job and uh, it was the job of your dreams with the paycheck you were hoping for and you thought, boy, this is just the best day of my life. What has been the best day of your life? Maybe it was the day that you bought a new home here in Charlotte and it was the home of your dreams and and uh, the realtor handed you the keys and you walked in and you thought, man, this is just great. This is what I've always wanted. This is the best day of my life. Or maybe it was uh, the day that you walked arm in arm back down the aisle with the love of your life into a new world and a new, new uh, destiny together as husband and wife. Maybe that was the best day of your life. Or maybe it was uh, a, a short time after that when you welcome this new little bundle of joy home from the hospital. Was that the best day of your life? What has been the best day of your life? Let's pray together. God, as we open your word, we pray that uh, it would be your voice that we would hear today, that you would just use me as your instrument, speak through me, that we may all leave here as changed and new people, for we ask it in your name. Amen. There was an upholsterer working in the office of Dr. Meyer Friedman. Meyer Friedman was a cardiologist, and he was having the chairs in his waiting room reupholstered. And the upholsterer came to him and he said, Doc, there's some strange things going on with the, with the chairs in your waiting room. And Dr. Friedman said, well, please, sir, tell me what's going on with, with the furniture in my waiting room. And the upholsterer said, Doc, usually when I replace the fabric on a chair, the whole chair is worn out. The back bolster, the armrest, the entire seat, the whole thing needs to be replaced. But he said, Doc, your chairs aren't like that at all. Only the very edges of the seat are worn out. And Dr. Friedman began to wonder, what is it about my patients? What is it about the people who are coming to my office that they're sitting on the edge of their seats. What kind of thoughts are going through their mind? I don't wanna be here. I don't have time for this. I've got things to do, places to be. What kind of emotions are coursing through their bodies? Fear, anxiety, uncertainty. That revelation became the catalyst for what Friedman would later call type A personality. Fast-paced, easily agitated, hard-charging, driven individuals who are the poster children of a society living on the edge of its seat. Is that normal? Is that the way we're supposed to live? Is there a better way to live? Does the Bible offer us any solutions about how we should actually live our life? As I thought about that, my mind went to one of the most famous passages in all of Scripture, It is often read at funerals, which is kind of ironic, because it's not about death at all, it's about life. It's about a new way of life that is available and accessible to each one of us. In Psalm 23, David writes, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. Let me ask you a question. What kind of life do you really want to live? David says, the Lord is my shepherd. 
What is the alternative? What is the alternative? It's to live life without a shepherd. That means that every day and every moment of every day, you go through the day with the burden of life on your shoulders. Life without a shepherd is a life lived on the edge of your seat. Life without a shepherd is a life lived with unending worry. We worry about the future. We worry about our children. And if we don't have children, we worry about that. We worry about our marriage. And if we aren't married, we worry about that. We worry about our money. And if we are running low on money, we worry about that too. The big thing that we're really worrying about in all of these micro worries, the, the macro worry, is will my life turn out the way I want it to, the way I have envisioned? Anybody here ever worry? How many of you have discovered that worry is a constructive and life-giving way of dealing with the future? You know, you wake up at 3 a.m. and you've got these thoughts running through your head about work undone or problems at work or problems in relationships, problems with your kids. How many of you wake up at 3 o'clock and you've discovered that if you just lie there and you worry about it long enough that somehow those problems will be miraculously solved? That's not been my experience. You know, when I wake up at three o'clock in the morning and there's this tape running through my head about something that I'm concerned about, I've not found that worrying about it uh, makes it any better. There is another way to live, and that is to live in the constant care, presence, and protection of the good shepherd. You know, King David knew shepherds. He knew sheep. Before he was king, he was a shepherd boy. He knew that the fate of the sheep depends upon the shepherd. Philip Keller is also a shepherd. He was a shepherd. And he's written a wonderful book on the 23rd Psalm. I don't think it's in print anymore, but if you can get your hands on it, I encourage you to read it. This is part of what he writes. He says that sheep do not just take care of themselves. They require more attention and meticulous care than any other class of livestock because he says sheep in our day have gone a little crazy how about people do you think we've gone a little bit crazy we kind of run from here to there in a hurry and in a fury always something to do always somewhere to be always something on our minds never a moment just to be a human being instead we are human doings dallas willard wrote that hurry is the great enemy of the spiritual life in our day because it will keep you from actually experiencing God's goodness and care from one moment to the next. Did you hear that? Hurry is the great enemy of the spiritual life in our day. Now there's a difference between being busy and being hurried. Jesus was often busy, he was never hurried. Being busy is an outward condition of your body. Being hurried is an internal situation with your spirit and your soul. To be hurried is a disease of the soul. To be hurried means that I am so eternally preoccupied with my own worries, with my own agenda, that I am unable to live in the presence of my Heavenly Father who loves me. And so, dear friends, at the Sharon Church, you must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. And just so we remember that today, I want you to turn to the person seated next to you and say, ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. You know, as you are ruthlessly eliminating hurry from your life, uh, you have to replace it with something better, right? We're told that when we try to get rid of a bad habit, if we don't replace it with a good habit, a more foul and unclean spirit will come, over, come in and take over the space where the bad habit used to exist. And so as you are ruthlessly eliminating hurry, I want to invite you today to replace it with an abiding spirit. An abiding spirit. Just rest in God's spirit, presence. Experience the joy of his presence and allow yourself to bask in thankfulness. Instead of worry and hurry and complaint, just be thankful. When you look into the eyes of someone you love, 
someone who loves you, be thankful that God has given you that person. When you remember a mother or a father, a mentor, someone who believed in you along the way, be thankful, be thankful. When you remember a sin or a regret, a time you blew it really bad, think about Jesus. Think about what he did on the cross. And now you don't have to carry that weight around anymore. Wow, we can be thankful. We don't have to live with regret. You see, this is not just about human cleverness. It's not about managing life more effectively. It's not even about slowing down necessarily. It is literally the gift of the good shepherd in your life. Jesus, who was the good shepherd, quite deliberately said, I am the good shepherd. And so I want to ask you today, do you need a good shepherd in your life? Do you want a good shepherd for your life? Jesus has done that for us. He stretched out his arms on the cross of Calvary and he gave his life for you. In doing that, he promised you that if you accept his sacrifice, he will come into your heart and be willing to be the shepherd in your life as well. And so if you have never asked Jesus to be the good shepherd of your life, if you've never said, Lord, I need a friend, I need a savior, I need a leader in my life, you can do that today. Just in the quietness of the pew where you're sitting, in your own heart and mind, just say, God, I need a shepherd. Jesus, will you be my shepherd? And you know what? He'll come into your heart and into your life today and he'll be your good shepherd. And if you do that, it will be the best day of your life. I promise you. I promise you. And by the way, if you're doing that for the first time today, if you're inviting Jesus to be the good shepherd of your life, I want you to talk to Pastor Brian about it after church because he will help you. He will mentor you and guide you through next steps on how you can walk with Jesus. And he'll be excited to celebrate that with you. Warren Gill is a professor of animal husbandry at the University of Tennessee. He says that sheep spend up to 10 hours a day grazing. 10 hours a day. Can you imagine eating 10 hours a day? My goodness. Do you know what they spend the rest of their waking hours doing? Chewing the cud. I see a, a young person here in front. Do you know what chewing the cud is? You got any idea what chewing the cud is? No, no idea? Well, I'll tell you. So a sheep, sheep are ruminants, and that means they chew the cud. And so a sheep has been grazing peacefully in the pasture for breakfast. He's eating some clover and some grass. And then he lays down, and he's thinking about what a good breakfast he had. And he says, you know, that was some really good grass. I'd like to taste it again. And he burps it back up into his mouth. And he chews on it a little bit more. You know, um, I don't think any of us want to do that with our Cheerios this morning, do we? That would be kind of gross. But um, in actuality, people ruminate as well. Thankfully, we don't ruminate on our breakfasts. At least most of us don't. But instead, we ruminate on our worries, our cares, our anxiety, our problems. So today, I want to just invite you to ruminate on Jesus instead. Just feed your soul with him because he loves you. He's caring for you. When you do that, when you make him your shepherd, when you ruminate on him, just think about him, just focus on him, it will be the best day of your life. David goes on. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. That means he's caring for me. He's providing for me. I can live a joyful, grateful life. I don't have to live as a collection of appetites. I don't have to live a life driven by unsatisfied desire. Uh, some years ago, the insurance company Fidelity did a survey with 1,000 millionaires. They asked 1,000 millionaires, do you feel rich? Now here's the interesting thing. These 1,000 millionaires had an average net worth of three and a half million dollars. And they said, do you feel rich? 60% of them said, guess what? No, they said no. 
And so they asked these 1,000 millionaires with an average net worth of three and a half million dollars, how much money would you need in order to feel rich? The average response was seven and a half million dollars, twice what they had. You see, we live in a world where enough is never enough. We are constantly worried that we'll either lose the stuff that we've accumulated or we'll run out of money and be unable to buy more stuff. To make it worse, we live in a world where some of the smartest people spend their best waking hours on Madison Avenue coming up with ideas to convince us that we need more stuff. That we are one acquisition away from happiness. If we could just get a new car, if we could just get new golf clubs, if we could just get a new dress or a new uh, range in our kitchen, something would make us happy. If we just had this one thing, the flock says you can be happy if you have a better car, a bigger house, a better wardrobe, if your clothes are prettier, if your teeth are whiter, if your breath is fresher, if your body is sleeker, then you'll be happy. Here's the, here's the truth, though, friends. No matter how much we attain in material possessions, no matter how much we attain in material possessions, they never bring us soul satisfaction. They always leave us with emptiness. Ask anybody who's gone down the path of trying to find satisfaction through possessions, and they will tell you that tale. The prophet Isaiah said that all we, like sheep, have gone astray. The flock says you need more, and we follow the flock. Let me put it into a little bit of perspective for you. If you make $28,000 a year, 28000 no matter how you get it, alimony, palimony, child support, food stamps, your salary, social security, however you get $28,000. If you make $28,000 a year, you are wealthier than 90% of the people in the world. 90% of the people in the world. If you make $84,000 a year, you are wealthier than 99% of the people in the world. There is another way. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I shall not want. Can you imagine living an existence where you don't want? Where you don't want something? Do we need to hear the possibility that God is calling us to an alternative way of life? The Lord is my shepherd I shall not want. We don't have to go through life driven in the pursuit of, of acquisition, of trying to fulfill the insanity of believing that if we have more, we will finally be happy. You know, there's only one way to successfully break this cycle. One way. Did you know that people who give worry less about their finances than people who hoard? It's true. It's, it's, um, I've seen it played out again and again. And it's been one of the blessings that God has given me to travel around North America and watch people go on this journey together. We were doing a campaign for a church in Western North Carolina. And they were building a family life center behind their church, gymnasium family life center. And um, we had challenged each of the families in the church to pray about what God wanted to do in their life. And one family was sitting around their kitchen table and they were praying about how they could sacrifice to make this building a reality. And their 15-year-old da daughter was sitting there at the table with them. The parents had included the kids so that they could have, you know, some input. And this young girl had lived with the dream for the last six years. She wanted to go with Maranatha on a mission trip. She had saved every bit of birthday money, every bit of babysitting money, anything that came into her hands, she had saved it so that she could go on a mission trip. She needed $3,000. She had saved half of it. She was going to work at uh, summer camp that summer and earn an additional $1,500 so that the next year she could go with Maranatha on a mission trip. As her parents talked about sacrifice and generosity and some of the concepts that they had been discovering and learning, um, she said, 
mom and dad, I feel like God wants me to contribute the $1,500 I've saved and, and commit the $1,500 that I'll earn this summer. And her mom said, honey, that's your mission trip money. If you, if you give that, your dad and I aren't going to be able to replace that because we're giving sacrificially as well. And, and you won't be able to go on your mission trip. And she said, mom, she said, I'm young. There'll be lots of opportunities for mission trips for me in the future. This is my chance to do something great for my church and for God. And so she, um, she put $1,500 in the offering plate the next Sabbath and filled out her commitment card for $3,000 with 1500 more committed. And her pastor found out about her sacrifice. And he said, would you be willing to tell the church family about your sacrifice? And she said, yeah. And so she stood up and she told the church about what God uh, had, had inspired her to do. And there was not a dry eye in the house. People recognized that it wasn't just $3,000. It was a dream that she had had for five years that she was willing to sacrifice. And it changed the church. It changed their perspective on the things that God places into our hands. You know, I've often seen that when people step out in faith and sacrifice and they give to God, that God often ends up being the one who provides the sacrifice. There was a family in Ohio. They were not relatives of this young lady. They didn't even know her. They heard the story through the Adventist grapevine about what she had done. And they sent her a card in the mail. And it said, young lady, you have inspired us. Inside the card was a check for $3,000. And they said, go on your mission trip. Go on your mission trip. We can't outgive God. When we give to him sacrificially, he always takes care of our needs. And sometimes he takes care of our wants as well. When you embrace sacrificial giving, it will be the best day of your life. I promise you. David goes on, he says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He makes me. We often don't think about God making us do something, do we? He makes me lie down. Kind of makes me remember my children when they were small and it was nap time. And I would try to get them to take a nap and they didn't want to lie down. They didn't want to take a nap and they would fight it. You could see the sleepiness in their little faces, but they didn't want to take a nap. We don't often want to lie down. We prefer to be in control. And when we don't lie down, the alternative is just frantic activity where we run around trying to control everyone and everything in our lives. I remember when Cindy and I were first married. It was one of our first breakfasts together as husband and wife. And she had set the table for us with some uh, boxes of cereal and cereal bowls. And she had put a banana in front of my bowl and in front of her bowl. And, you know, I don't think I'd ever seen my wife open a banana until that moment. You know, sometimes when you're dating and you're falling in love, you, things just kind of go over your head. God puts these blinders on you or else women would never marry us. Right, guys? It's just kind of how it works. But um, I had never noticed or seen how she opened a banana. And I was horrified that she was opening her bananas the wrong way. How many of you, when you open your banana, you hold it like this, you grab the stem and do that? How many of you do that? Oh, I'm so sorry. Those of you who do that, you're opening your banana the wrong way. And I told Cindy this, and I told her how I knew. When I was a kid, I went to Camp Calaqua in Florida, and there was some kind of jungle gym guy who had a little pet monkey on his shoulder. And he was telling us all about monkeys and their eating habits and everything about them. And he said, you know, monkeys are experts in eating bananas. They eat more bananas than any other creature. And he gave the monkey a banana, and the monkey held it like this, and he peeled it from the top. How many of you do that? Oh, I'm so glad there are some of you that actually know how to open your bananas appropriately. And so I shared this story with Cindy, you know, thinking that she would be impressed about, you know, how to appropriately open your banana. And, and she was not impressed at all. In fact, she let me know that she'd been opening bananas all her life. 
and she had no intention of uh, changing the way she did it. Uh, sometimes when we're sitting at breakfast and she has her banana, she will look me in the eye and do this <laughs> on purpose. And if I say anything, she says, okay, monkey boy, just be quiet. <laughs> I have come to realize that she's going to go to her grave opening bananas the wrong way. It's painful to realize, but you know, sometimes we just have to accept, right? Do you have somebody in your life who is peeling their banana the wrong way? Whatever the banana is, if they just did it your way, it would be so much better. So much better. Um, I tell you one thing that I've learned uh, in my life, guys, if you really want to you know, win some bonus points with your wife, just say to her, you know, my mother did that this way. Women really love that when you do that. We go crazy over little things in our life. Whatever the banana is, however they're peeling it, we feel like we have a better way. That if people just did things the way we do it, the world would be a happier place. And we kind of get a little crazy sometimes over things that aren't very important. And it's because we live with an illusion. We live with the illusion that we are in control. It is an illusion that some of us cling to because it reduces or seems to reduce anxiety. We feel like we are in control, that we control the people in our life, we control circumstances, we control our careers and our finances, we control our health. If we just are careful to manage everything and everybody, then everything will turn out okay. Friends, sooner or later, we all come to the realization that we are not in control. That we are not in control. It may be the middle of the night, you've got a 16 or 17 year old son, and you get a call from the county sheriff or the chief of police in uh, downtown Charlotte, and they say, is this your son? I've got a young man here in custody, and they give you the name, and you say, yep, that's my son. And the the sheriff says, well, you better come down and bail him out. And you realize that you aren't in control of that young man anymore. Maybe um, it's a situation where you're sitting by the bedside of somebody you love with all your heart, a parent, a child, a spouse, and the doctor comes in and gives you a piece of information that you really, really did not want to hear. And you realize that all of your bananas are being peeled the wrong way. And there's nothing you can do about it. Nothing you can do about it. There's another way to live your life. You don't have to wait until illness strikes or tragedy. And that is just to let go. Just let go of the burden of control. Now, that doesn't mean that there isn't a role for us to play in life. It doesn't mean that God doesn't give us gifts and abilities and intellect, and, and he holds us accountable for that. He wants us to use our mind and our abilities. It just means that we aren't meant to live with the burden of outcomes. Outcomes are not our purview. God doesn't call us to be responsible for outcomes. He only calls us to be faithful, to do our best, we are not meant to live with the outcome, the weight of outcomes. You can't control any other person. You can't control anything in your life. And so just let go. What gives sheep assurance to rest is the presence of the good shepherd. And I'll tell you a secret. If the good shepherd is present in your life, it's a green pasture. You can be in a marriage with someone who in their heart are not consecrated to God and you know that your home life is not a happy place, that there is recrimination, there is manipulation, there's all kinds of toxicity in your relationship. If Jesus is there in the home with you, he can make that a green pasture. You can be in a work environment where it's dog-eat-dog dog and everybody's stabbing everybody else in the back to climb the ladder. And it can be a green pasture if Jesus is there with you. Maybe it's your school environment and you're being bullied or picked on by other students. Maybe people are 
making life difficult for you in class. And that can be a green pasture if Jesus is there. Because he's in the soul restoring business. He loves you. He's there with us. And he is always, always in control. Nothing will happen to us that he doesn't have his finger on. That he isn't weighing what's in our best interest and the best interest of everyone else around us. Even a hospital room where you get bad news can be a green pasture because Jesus is there. He's the good shepherd. Just trust him, just rest in him. In Psalm 127, verse 2, one of my favorite verses, it says, In vain you rise up early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat, for he grants sleep to those he loves. And dear friends, some of you have not slept well in a long time. You haven't slept well in a long time because your night times are filled with fear and anxiety about the future. Your life is a gift and rest is a gift. We need to rest in the shepherd and rest with our fellow sheep, live in harmony and community. When we embrace that way of living, it will be the best day of your life. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Before I came to uh, the Sharon Church to serve here, I was pastoring in Banner Elk and Valley Cruces. I know Ross Knight uh, did a stint there. And uh, that was a great, great place to serve. I really enjoyed Banner Elk. And um, this was, uh, I'm dating myself now, this was in the days before digital photography. And we wanted a church directory that had pictures of every family in the church. And so we found a photographer, I don't think it was Olin Mills, but it was something like that. And they came in and, and they were going to, for free, take a picture of every family in the church and give us church directories for every family in the church. The, the key was, is they hoped that they could sell the pictures to the families. You know, that would give them an opportunity to do that. And so I was really excited about it. You know, sometimes when we have these events in our life that we're trying to control, we go through stages. The first stage that I was in was, was excitement. You know, I was going to have this picture of my, my little kids, and I was going to be able to keep it forever. It was just going to be wonderful. And so I was in this excited phase. And, and then I kind of went into a phase of naivety. Um, as the pastor, I decided that my family should be first to set the example. And so I scheduled us for 8.30 on Sunday morning. Um, how many of you have tried to get four kids ready for church again at 8.30 on Sunday morning after having done it the previous day? And, and they kind of went into a little bit of rebellion over this idea. They were hiding their Sabbath shoes and their little socks and things like that and, and trying to, you know, uh, stall the process so that I couldn't get them to church. And so then I went into a, a different phase. I went into the bribery phase. And there was a Hardee's across the, the street from the Banner Elk Church. And I said, okay, kids, if, if everybody will get ready and we'll go to church and we'll, we'll smile for the, for the cameraman and we'll have nice pictures. And when we're done, I'll get everybody an ice cream cone. And I thought that was going to be a great idea. Uh, the problem was is that Mindy, being the oldest, was a typical oldest child. Some of you remember Mindy. And Mindy wanted the ice cream cone. She was going to make sure she got the ice cream cone. And so that meant prodding, pinching, and pushing her younger siblings to make sure that they complied and they were in line. And that created all-out chaos. By the time we got to the church, everybody was crying. Everybody was crying. And um, then I went into the threatening phase where I said okay kids if you're going to cry I'm going to give you something to cry about and of course that didn't help it things just spiraled downward from there and they began to cry and they were all upset and I looked at these four kids Jay was a baby you know if we got him even making eye contact with the camera it was going to be a miracle Grace uh, was ADD personified um, she was everywhere, doing everything, always busy. And I thought, yeah, 
not much I can do about that either. And then I looked at Allison. Allison was five, and Allison was usually kind of my calm and peaceful child. You know, each of our children have different personalities. But Allison was really upset. And I thought to myself, she's old enough to follow directions and understand what I'm telling her and to obey. And so I pulled Allison aside, and Allison loved stuffed animals. Her favorite was this little purple bear that she called Mr. Sprinkles. And I pulled Allison aside, and I got down on my knees, and I tenderly held her little hands in mine. And I said, Allison, I bet more than anything right now you'd like to hold Mr. Sprinkles, wouldn't you? And she couldn't even talk. I mean, she was sobbing. She was just shaking. Her little body was shaking. Stuff was running out of her nose. It was, it was a mess. It was bad. And I said, Allison, if you ever want to see Mr. Sprinkles alive again, <laughs> you will settle down and smile for the camera. It was not uh, my proudest moment of fatherhood. You see, when we, um, when we try to live in control and control other people with our agendas, we forget to lie down in green pastures, we forget to live beside quiet waters, and what comes out is anger and irritation and frustration, usually with the people we love the most, right? Surely I'm not the only one who's ever done that, right? Um, we can't create this calm by our own. Ladies, if you really want your husband to calm down, just tell him, just calm down, because that always works just like that, right? When your husband's upset about something. You see, life lived to its fullest is just a series of moments when the Good Shepherd is present. When he's with you, when he's walking with you, when you know he's there, when you can sense his presence, you know everything is going to be all right. Everything is going to be all right. And friends, you will never know him as your good shepherd unless you personally make him your good shepherd. If he was your mother's, that's not good enough. If he was your father's, that's not good enough. If he's Pastor Brian's, that's not good enough. You need to make him your good shepherd. And so this week, let him be your shepherd. Instead of worrying about stuff, ruminate on him. Instead of wallowing in discontent, be grateful for him. Instead of trying to control everything and everybody, just surrender to him. And instead of the noise and the chaos, listen to him. And then you can stop living life on the edge of your seat, and it will be the best day of your life.